This is Twit. I'm I'm actually more curious rather than talking about the events in AI and there's there's a few quite a few you know Chat GPT Microsoft's AI is now available to almost everybody I think I, everybody's been playing with it uh, and discovering all new things Lawrence Abrams over at Bleeping Computer said he's found some hidden celebrity modes Chat GPT will uh, respond in the voice of your favorite celebrity whether it be The Rock or Barack and uh, and. It's so stupid, I can't even believe that he wrote an article about it. Yeah, everybody in the uh, IRC is going... <laughs> I, I wonder, is... It, now, look, you, you, you can recuse yourself. You work for Microsoft. But I'm kind of thinking, um, this, is, this is starting to look like a party trick more than an actual transformative technology. What's your thought, Lou? It's a good question. I think I see a lot of implementations of it. Like, like people who show it online like through YouTube videos or whatnot, of course, they're going to show the parlor tricks. They're going to show the stuff that's really interesting. They're going to generate a, a picture that, you know, from, you know, a Midgard and they're going to go in or Dolly and then they're going to go feed it into a video so they can generate their own video and they're going to generate text. So like it, it becomes a parlor trick after you see all those things. But I'll tell you, I've, you know, obviously I can't talk about a lot of the stuff that we're working on, but I can say that a lot of the things that will be coming out in the next you know year or so are things that will directly impact everybody's lives whether it be business or and i'm talking about like productivity to um you know to safety to um you know whatever you want to would think about now the, the things that are showing right now sure parlor tricks because it's the way that they you know they get it out there they get people interested or they get people thinking about it but the reality is this stuff is, is really going to be interesting what people are going to utilize it for. You agree, uh, Dan Morin? I think I think there's something to that. I mean, I think that the, the flash is going to wear off like the novelty aspect, right? That's what comes out of the gate strong. People are really interested. It generates a lot of attention. But it's not the stuff that ultimately long term is really going to be as useful when it comes to AI. I mean... I think despite all the fears that people are going to use this to like write their papers for college or replace human workers. I mean, I've heard of this happening on very small scales in a couple of places, but I think ultimately the more interesting stuff that it can do just sort of generally when you throw it at a problem, I've seen a lot of like the, the best sort of examples I've seen of, of the utility of this is thing like honestly writing code, like it just, it, or being like an aid to writing code. Cause like I, I work on code sometimes and I get stuck because I'm not like a programmer. It's not my main job. And I'm like, man, I need an algorithm that does X and I am like, I could bang my head and spend all my time Google searching and try to like reconstruct it if nobody's done exactly what I've done. Or I could ask an AI like, hey, do you have an algorithm that does this? And even if it's like 90% of the way there, that's pretty good. And it saves me a lot of time. So I think there's a lot of cases like that where it's going to be super useful for people trying to cut through all the noise, especially when it comes to like search. I think that's one of the reasons that Google has felt very threatened by this is that if you can just ask a chat bot and get a pretty good answer along with like a source, it really solves. Like, I feel like Google these days, I type in search queries and I have to like just scroll through a lot of things. And there's like, oh, there's like 20 different sites and they all have their own opinion about the answer. And like, sometimes you just want to cut through the noise. And I think that's one of the things AI seems good at. Uh, do you, and Father Robert, do you think Google is going, oh, we got to hurry up and get this barred out or going, whew, we dodged a bullet. Let's wait and see what happens. Yeah, I, I think that they are taking the, the cautious approach, which is good because hopefully somebody over there has looked at the trend and realized this is just an advanced version, maybe the final version of big data analytics that we had in 2013. In 2013, data analytics came out, and it was this idea of taking these huge data sets and building the tools to do predictive analysis based on the correlation between those data sets. That's essentially what today's AI does. It just uses these enormous data sets to be able to predict what human speech would be like or what the next bit of code should be like. So uh, there should be someone looking at that and saying, this is useful. This will be something that we can monetize. This will be something that we can commercialize in these sectors, but it ain't AI. And we got to stop calling it AI because we're scaring the people who are thinking that it's Skynet when really it's the next version of Siri. <laughs> yeah, I actually think it's kind of more like autocorrect in your, in your uh, iPhones. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it kind of fundamentally is the way it works. And there was a great article we've mentioned before. Um, 
by uh, Stephen Wolfram uh, on his Wolfram Alpha blog, in which he actually explained how these large language model works. And essentially, it is, you know, picking the next word, uh, and then it, and it ranks them, and then uh, it mixes it up a little bit, so it gives you a different result each time. But it's really kind of autocorrect on steroids. On the other hand, it does come up with some funny things. Thanks uh, to our chat room for passing this tweet along from Ethan Mollick. Bing, write the first chapter of Genesis as a corporate memo to all employees from God. CEO, subject, creation project status report. Dear team, I'm pleased to share with you the progress of our creation project for the past week. Here's a summary of what we've accomplished so far. On day one, we initiated the light and darkness differentiation process. We branded the light as day and the night as darkness as night. This was a major milestone for our project as it established the basic framework for our work environment and, and on and on. And I think it's, it's actually a very interesting summary of Genesis <laughs> in a corporate memo. Therefore, I hereby declare that tomorrow will be day seven of our project cycle. It will be a day of rest for all of us. So, um, congratulations! We've just created artificially intelligent <laughs> Mad Libs. <laughs> it's yes, and I guess that's my point. It's essentially it's 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 Mad Libs, isn't it? It's it's smart Mad Libs based on a very large corpus of of information, the internet as a whole. But it's not much more than Mad Libs, and it's certainly not intelligence. It's not thinking. It's for for sure not sentient, as Blake Lemoyne thought it was. Right. Uh, thanks to Matt Ryder in our um, discourse, or Discord, rather, who uh, asked ChatGPT to write Leo Laporta podcast about the latest news in AI. <laughs> How AI is changing the world from ChatGPT to Meta. In this episode, Leo Laporte shares some of the recent developments and trends in artificial intelligence that are shaping our future. He talks to experts and researchers about the hype and controversy surrounding chat GPT, an AI system that can generate realistic text. Well, that's a really telling phrase, a realistic text on almost any topic. How is chat GPT being used for good and evil? What are the ethical and social implications of a, such a powerful technology? This really steals the punchline from the, wait, did an AI write this? No, wait, that, it did. <laughs> Dang it. Dang it. It's not even a good joke anymore. <laughs> did you watch? So last Sunday, uh, this this came to mind because last Sunday, uh, John Oliver uh, on his This Week Tonight, it, the main segment was AI. And he mocked, first of all, he mocked all the news reporters who are doing exactly that. Reading their, you know, their piece and then saying, and by the way, this was written by Jet GBT. Ha ha. Uh, I did not do that. You notice, Dan. I, <laughs> I did. I flipped. Well, well, I mean, yeah. the joke is on them. I mean, everyone right. fell for that because we are expecting them not to have good copy. We know <laughs> that what we get on social media and exactly on the news is bad copy. Expected. Yeah, it's exactly what we expected from local news. Um, but I, I was, uh, and Lisa will testify because we were, we were watching this together, and I was kind of yelling at the TV uh, because he, he made some fundamental errors. One was confusing algorithms with AI. Lou, you probably know more than anything as a programmer. That's they're two different things, aren't they? I mean, you got to use uh, you know linear math and and particular algorithms and formulas within that to be able to produce the the models and train the models that you are actually using. So yeah, you write a program. It's not a fundamental to, algorithm. Yeah, right. you write a program algorithmically to create these models, but right. what the computer is doing once it's it's running uh, is not algorithmic, or is it? That's a, I think, I've stumped him. I, I Let's mean, ask yes. ChatGPT. <laughs> in in the sense that it's math, it's yeah. algorithmic. Yeah. Right. But what we think of when we hear algorithmic is we think of the one that Google is using to rank search or Twitter's yeah. using to remove trollish content. Or even and as a coder, that's much more linear. Even as a coder, I think yeah, linear algebra. That's algorithms. You know, uh, Dijkstra's uh, uh, pathfinding algorithm. Uh, you know, uh, two plus two algorithmic, if then else algorithmic. I always, I think of AI as something kind of beyond algorithms in this. In the, and this is another thing John Oliver brought up. Oh my God, people don't know what the, what the chat, why the AI does what it does, right? It's a black box, isn't it? It's not, exa it's not exactly algorithmic. Who? To who, though? I mean, it's it, to, to the consumer, it's a black box. But, but I even the to the coder, it's a black box. You can't look at... If you look at uh, AlphaGo, 
the the machine that learned to play chess better than humans by teach by the way all they did was teach it the rules of chess and then it played billions of games against itself over a period of 4 hours then became really good at chess better than any human at chess we don't we can't look inside of that model and and understand what the we can't in a way that humans can understand state what the rules are right i mean that is a black box from that well, point of view, isn't it? It trained, it trained, essentially trained itself. So it fed its own training right. data. And so I would say, yeah, you could go in and look at the training data that it's using to actually produce the, the output that it's actually, you know, cause it's running through these specific translation models, transformation models in order to produce it. So I would say, yeah, you could go and look inside the look at the okay. data that it's using. All right. Well, you're the coder here. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll defer to your expertise. <clears throat> I always, uh, uh, and, and I guess Oliver did get this part wrong, assumed that once you come up with these models, you can't, I mean, you don't, you can't look at them and say, oh yeah, I can see what it's doing here. Or can you? I guess you can. You're saying you can. I mean, you can, you can, in, you can, can in real time, but you can in like, as, as it, as it builds it out, you can look inside and look at, because okay. all these things are, I mean, again, you said it's algorithmic. Yeah. I mean, it's in machine learning in general is these large deep learning models that are algorithmic in nature and so they are definitive they're they're not they're not they're not redefining themselves as they move along they're the same it's unless you go somebody goes and redefine the model for themselves they're deterministic right deterministic correct uh yeah although uh in order to produce different results every time they've they add a little fuzzing right they add uh little probabilities correct. to it right Right, but yeah, okay. I'll, I'll have you have you done some of this uh, coding, this large language model stuff? For me, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think the really <laughs> the interesting thing that you know that's happening at Microsoft is it's like probably the most fun I've, I've had in, in a long time, and it's because it's a complete culture shift. It's you know people, a lot of the experts in the company who know a lot about this stuff, who've done it for years in research, and they're teaching everybody else who might not be a data scientist or computer, you know, you know it, that really understands this stuff deeply. And so we're going, I'm going through trainings, and I'm, I feel oh, like I'm taking exciting. classes, and oh, that's so it's neat. really, it's actually really exciting, even for somebody who hasn't you know done that stuff before. And I've learned a lot, like in a very short time. So now, so, okay, you are our expert. You are our AI. I haven't said that. Well, I should have said anything now. <laughs> You're our AI expert. Enough to be dangerous. Um, but I mean, Lou, this should this is right up Dynamics Alley, right? I mean, if you're talking about a a feature set that would be beneficial to a product, Dynamics is one of those where it would be great. Uh, it does exactly what you would expect a, a CRM to do. Yes. Oh yeah. I mean, I could see lots of applications uh, applied to CRMs to to uh you know to erps to power apps to i mean there's just an endless set of features that can happen and i can promise you there will be an endless endless set of features that will come out that will go with those things is that what you're working on lou now is dynamics no i, I work in still work in the office still in office uh, microsoft okay. office yep um but I, I work in the developer side of things so the extensibility side of things and there's again just like dan was saying there's endless opportunities there as well to to be able to use uh, these things to help you kind of bridge the gap and have a, an easier jump start and a lower barrier for you to get in and, and develop stuff as a developer. And right. of course, Microsoft has said that they're going to include chat GPT capabilities in office. Uh, so is, is so and copilot, which is uh, GitHub's version of this uh, also a Microsoft product is uh, aimed at, at developers. In fact, copilot has now a brush mode, right? Where you, <laughs> I don't understand quite how it works. Is like a paintbrush mode? Is that is that how it works? I don't know. I actually don't know that. Oh, okay. You know more than okay. me on that one. Yeah, <laughs> they announced it. I read it. I don't understand it. So there's so not, many coming out. Like it's about just hard to keep track of them. But all. the idea was uh, in, in using Copilot is you know you'd you'd start writing some login code and uh, much like Clippy, mm -hmm. it could it could finish it for you. You wouldn't. It would not be prudent. Although people paste stuff in from Stack Overflow all the time, but it would, I would think it would not be prudent to just accept it and say fine and move on, even if it compiles. It's not necessarily correct. This is one thing we're learning about these big language models: is they're not they're not tuned they make, for correct. They make 
they make stuff up. I they mean, make stuff up. I, I think hallucinations. I was, hallucinations, yeah. I was telling this story, I think, when we talked to Mac Break, Leo, about how I, f- I basically asked it to summarize the plot of one of my novels, and it just made up stuff. <laughs> like, it was <laughs> no way related to the plot. I was like, was okay, it any good? or? <laughs> no, I'm going to say no. I, and it's I had an alternate this, ending. Yeah, yeah this, you know. uh, uh, on Mastodon, my pal uh, Chris Breen, who used to be one of my colleagues at Macworld, um, he, a, a friend of his asked it about him, and it told his friend that he had died. And yes, it provided I saw a that. link. Yes. It provided a link to an obituary on Macworld. And it, like I was reading this, and like, man, the title reads like if Chris had died, <laughs> this is what the title of his obituary would be. But it was like a URL. It gave a URL that went nowhere. But it was like, that was just disturbing and weird right it, it was made like, up oh no he's he's definitely dead and he's like no he isn't that's got to be so you, you weird to us. see that and think <sighs> well, let me see if i can find it because yeah here's the uh here christopher bream who is christopher bream from Macworld? we know chris because he's been on our shows many times christopher bream was a, was a longtime editor and columnist at Macworld, well-known figure in the apple community wrote extensively on a wide range of topics sadly bream passed away in 2018 but his contributions to the tech journalism world and his legacy as a trusted source of information and insight live on. Yeah, because he's still alive. <laughs> that is, I don't know how you get there from, I mean, wow. This well, is the I mean, next would, generation of trolling. People are going to figure yeah, out how to right. poison the data wells right. that these, these AI models are drawing on. And they're going to make just little tweaks so that when you make these, these very popular GPT searches, you're going to come up with the information you want them to find. But it's the same thing back to Leo talking about autocorrect too, right? How many of the times have you ended up with autocorrect telling you to change something that's right, right? It gives you, like, it insists oh, on yes, writing absolutely. we, you know, W E apostrophe L L when you're trying to type the word well, uh, you know, and, and it's just, you can type something wrong enough times and it'll be like, well, you keep typing guess, it. So it's probably it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's ducking right. Here is this Chris. Chris was responding to uh, another Mastodon toot from a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana in Information Sciences in English, and uh, this Bing said, "Hello, this is Bing. I see you're interested in Ted Underwood, professor, uh, blogger, Twitter user, studies literary imagination and machine learning. Unfortunately, he passed away on August 28th at his home." And it's it, it, he's creepy not. to have an AI tell you a machine learning expert is dead because it feels like. Yeah. You're being like, oh, no, I'm going to go ask an expert. It's like, oh, yeah. no, no, that that guy's dead. No, you shouldn't ask him about machine learning. <laughs> to which Ted toots terribly sad, and I have to say I'm angry that I wasn't informed. <laughs> 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 like Bruce Willis in The Sixth Sense, I'm always the last to know. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, I, by the way, immediately tried to figure out if I was dead, but ChatGPT says I'm still alive, unfortunately. So, But maybe if I keep... Keep working at it. If you love all things Android, well, I've got a show for you to check out. It's called All About Android, and I'll give you three guesses what we talk about. We talk about Android, the latest news, hardware, apps. We answer feedback. It's me, Jason Howell, Ron Richards, Wintwit Dow, and a whole cast of awesome characters talking about the operating system that we love. You can find All About Android at twit.tv slash AAA.